Welcome everyone. My name is Levette Jallo. I am the founder of a separatist forum in Sweden and the largest forum for black people in all of Scandinavia called Black Vogue. Now that forum was born out of a need for black Swedes to be able to share tips and tricks about finding beauty products suitable for our skin tone. Since as we know, the beauty industry loves to exclude people of color, especially black people. Now that forum became a gateway into me writing my first book, which became Europe's first makeup book for darker skin tones. Now that book led me to travel to Libya when 2015 we got news of the horrific situations that immigrants were facing there. And from then on, my activism has only grown and has led me to where I'm standing today. But more personally about who I am, I'm 34 years old. I was born in West Africa in a beautiful country called the Gambia. I was raised by a grandmother who was a politician for 30 years in the former Gambian government. She was also an entrepreneur and an activist for women's rights. I was also raised by a mother who's here today, who is also an entrepreneur, a mentor, and a teacher. Now, I moved to Sweden when I was 11, reason being the government was overthrown by a militia. And every single family that was involved within the previous government, such as my grandmother, we were all threatened under weapons. And that led me to coming to Sweden to be with my mother and my brothers. Now, you could say being an activist is something I was born into. Every single female in my family is an activist of some sort, either for children's right, for women's right, or in the political arena. So it's in my blood, I'd like to say. When Gant invited me to speak here on their Never Stop Learning, I decided I would tackle one of the most frequently asked questions on my forums. And that is how to be an ally to marginalized groups. And I like to quote Angela Davis, who said, in a racist society, it's not enough to be a non-racist. You have to be an anti-racist. Claiming you aren't racist isn't what matters, because it makes no difference if you are or aren't. What matters, however, is recognizing racism, calling it by its name, because it's not Voldemort, is it? And working towards eradicating it. So since this question has come up so frequently, I, I had to stop and think about it. Because how is it so hard for people to know how to fight and be an ally in a world where information is so readily available? Why are people who aren't affected by structural racism so confused about how to help? I mean, the information is out there, one would think. But I say, how can people who are not affected by structures be able to recognize them? I mean, it's like fighting an invisible enemy at the end of the day. How do you find it? How do you recognize it, really? especially since some of you look upon it as an invisible friend. You cannot wish to live in a world of equality and diversity whilst you live in white neighborhoods, send your children to white schools only, work in all white workplaces, media houses, advertising companies, and only follow white people online. To be an ally means you have to do more than just declare you're not a racist. It means listening, supporting, and validating the experiences of the people who speak regarding this. And how can that be done? I say it's quite obvious, but we'll get to that point shortly. According to one of my favorite Swedish researchers, Tobias Huvenet, 31.4% of Swedes, that's 11 million, 
have one or both parents who are immigrants. 31.4%. Out of the entire inhabitants of Sweden, 19% are people of color. That's black people, brown people, whoever is not white. That's quite a large number, right? Yet when we look around in society, we don't really see that being reflected in workplaces, in equal opportunities. Out of 11 million, the amount of Afro-Swedes is a mere 300,000. We are one of the smallest groups in Sweden. Yet nobody finds it strange that we are the most targeted group when it comes to hate crimes, for example. How is that possible? And why isn't it discussed? Now, that's, all those figures are taken from the Swedish um, Statistic Bureau um, that we call BRO. It's also taken from the Afrophobia Report by Tobias Hubenet. And when I spoke to the police before this actual lecture, they informed me that the amount of hate crimes against afro suite that actually get persecuted, that is, go to courts, it's only 4% of every single crime that is reported. Reason being, it's generally not somebody you know. It's unknown strangers on the street that tend to attack black people. Because I guess because our skin tends to announce when we arrive and where we are. So if, if you don't, feel comfortable with black people or have a racist agenda, it's very easy to pick us out in the crowd. And I'll repeat, it's no longer enough to say, I am not a racist, I mean well. Simply declaring it does nothing to break down the structures that already exist. And these structures exist, but they're also upheld and fed by the same people who don't recognize them being in place. So let's get straight into it. Like I said, step number one of being an ally is an obvious one. So obvious, in fact, that a ball is gonna drop once I say it. It's listening to the experiences of the people that are affected by the barriers in society. When we or I am part of that as well, because being woman and being black, for me, I cannot divide those two. So as we ask men to listen to women in the fight against misogyny, patriarchal sexism, so do marginalized groups need those not affected to listen, to learn, and then join the fight. Listening sounds very easy, but it's one of the hardest things for human beings to do including for myself. To be an ally, you need to believe in the people's experiences and stories. For by invalidating those stories and questioning the validity of those stories, that in itself is a racist act, because you're claiming that the people that experience racism don't have the right words to convey what they are feeling. And if you have lived a life Secure from these structures, I'm not saying you have an easy life, but we know structural racism affects mainly people of colour and black people at the bottom of that hierarchy. You will have a reaction, and this is something I see every day on my Instagram pages, in my emails, in my interactions with people. It seems like when you speak on racism, people have that strange re reaction within themselves where they feel like talking about it is accusing them. <laughs> and to direct this to you, if you read about things, you will want to ask, I've never seen it happen, so it can't be real. Or you'd be tempted to tone police people and say, if you're not such an angry person, when you speak about racism, maybe more people would listen. That's called turn policing, and that's something you never want to do. Ah. You might even want to point out, as somebody did just this morning to me, it's so terrible what these people are doing. And that in itself, 
you're distancing yourself from the problem. You're saying, I am not like these overtly racist people. When in fact, and what I have come to realize and had to explain at 6.30 a.m. this morning to a person online is, you want to distance yourself from those terrible racist people out there. Because that's the easy thing to do, isn't it? If you deem them as the bad white people, and you as the good one who does not harm people, you don't have to take your self-reflection seriously and think about how you uphold those same structures they overtly show, simply by your neutrality or your ignorance. There is no them and you. You can't distance the two. And when you are reminded of that fact, you will go into explanations you will say, I didn't mean it like that, like that, I am one of the good people. And you will explain to me what your intent is, but intent is never ever greater than the impact it has. And that's why we end up in these repetitive forms. Whenever you want to react to being an ally in that, in that way, stop yourself, take a moment, log out, Sit down and try to see the other person's perspective. Okay? If you have your mobile on, you can just put it on silent so it doesn't make noise. Because each time resisting comes up to the surface, you need to remind yourself that nobody who is subjected to oppression has an obligation to be nice or to teach you anything when information is available out there. There are only a few people like me who actually take the time because the rest are busy surviving and parading through these structures. And also, these people did not create these systems to oppress them, so why should they also have to teach other people how to see them when you could easily find those tools available? So in comparison to whenever we discuss men, there's always going to be a few men that says, not all men. Whenever we discuss racism, somebody has to remind us, not all white people. And the favorite um, point that comes up, which is, I didn't build this, I'd never owned slaves. Nobody's saying this generation or the one previous created this. We're saying you live in it, it benefits you, so hence it's also your responsibility to deal with. You should speak up, but never speak over marginalized people. Do a lot of self-reflection within yourself and see how you have been affected by prejudices. I mean, do you cross the road when you see a group of young people of color in the street? What has media been telling you about that? Examine your own prejudices, your unconscious biases, to minimize the damage that you may cause to other people, knowingly or unknowingly and then start working on it. The first step of being an ally is you. Change always begins with us as individuals. Step two is the home. At the dinner table during midsummer, Christmas dinner. When you're around family members, do you, after you've self-reflected, speak on subject matters of racism, the LGBTQ community, Islamophobia, homophobia, transphobia? anti-Semitism. Do you speak to your children about them? Your partner? Your racist uncle? Do you react when you hear racist language? Or do you let it slide because you think, this is our dinner table, there's no marginalized groups here, so it doesn't matter, I don't have to deal with it at this point in time. And I am Swedish, so I understand this Dolik uh, stemming we never want to create that. That is what our nightmares are made of. But are you afraid of creating Dolik Stemling, a bad vibe? The fact of the matter is, the first place we affect change after we've affected ourselves is our homes. With our friends, with our families, with our loved ones. And over the past few years, you may have followed, you may have not followed, maybe you're a recent follower, where people have sent in videos of them being attacked 
out in public and I've posted a video to help the police identify that person and give them that information. The back end of that, of my work, after someone's physically assaulted someone, called them the N-word and bashed their head in with a Coke bottle, for example, and we found them and we tell the police and they get called in and we know they will be released because not very much gets ever done about things like that. There's always a family member or two that will contact me and say, that's my uncle or that's my aunt or that's my sister actually. And they will build the trust with me and want to speak about a, that this attack may not be a one-time occurrence because this family member has always been slightly you know, racist after a couple of beers and now it's manifested into an actual physical assault. And that makes me ask, what conversations have happened that people let slide because they don't want to create Dolly stemming unchallenged that finally led that person to believe that they're so right that they have the right to attack somebody in public spaces? Could we have stopped it? if we took that conversation and challenged their thoughts? Most likely. And it's not like when we say, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to hear it, does it make a sound? No, yes. If your racist uncle is at the dinner table and says something very, very krenkamba, and there's no person of color to hear it, did he still say it? Will that have effect? The answer is a clear yes. It will still affect the way you think. It will affect the way your children who've heard that think. It will affect the way you interact with the world. And if you don't speak to your children about racism, if you don't speak to them about privilege of whatever kind, you're only stepping aside to allow society to do the teaching for you. And that could be one of the biggest mistakes you'll make when it comes to young people. Schools. I get a lot of students contacting me, firstly to ask me to do their homework, which if they knew how much I dislike doing homework, they wouldn't have tried that, but they still try it. They're very charming. But this is the first place you send your child from your home, from the safety of your coven, to learn, to gain knowledge to interact with other children. There, you may think the responsibilities with the school or in the curriculum or school varke. It's really not. You still have a responsibility as a parent to check the curriculum of all of the ladder plan, all of the books written by only white voices and white women and white men. Do they have black teachers? Do they have diversity? behind the scenes? Do they teach black history, Sapmi history? Do they talk about the Second World War? I think that's one of the few history lessons we do have. We know more about the Second World War than we know about the current situation of the Sapmi people, for example. What happens if your child bring home, brings home a book where there's the N-word written out quite clearly? How do you ensure that the teacher has spoken to your children about the usage of that word and what it meant in the 1900s and what it means now and how it's changed? What's the historical perspective? Who is responsible for all that? These are all things that lie within the realm of what we call being an ally. It really is. And if you're a child or a young adult, 12 to 18, and you're going to school, you also have a right to question the books that you are being given. You have the right to stand up and speak for your classmates if a teacher is racist, which we have seen happen in Falkenberry pretty recently, and a few others that I won't go into. In the workplace, and I guess that's who is in this room today, people that are in the workforce, people that have power in their hands to make a change. Are you an ally if you work in a workplace that employs 100% white only people in a country with 31.4%
non-white people. Can you call yourself an anti-racist or are you just a non-racist? You're just neutral. Do you ever even notice how blindingly white your workplaces might be? Or is it okay as long as the people that work there reflect your identity, but no one else's? Here is your chance to raise the question with HR about what they're doing to align themselves with their diversity clause. Because every company loves a C CSR. You go to their website, the Elske Mongfald. You go for a meeting and you see zero people of color, except the cleaners. And that has happened way too many times. What we're asking is not a workplace that is full of black people. That would be impossible with only 300,000 of us. But we want a workplace that reflects the society we live in. Because that not only benefits giving people the opportunity with their education to come into the workplace, it benefits you and your perspective. And you won't have to make similar mistakes like a well-known brand, clothing brand, earlier this year, took a black child and put a monkey t-shirt on them without even questioning the fact that black people have been called monkeys and gorillas since the Western world and the Arab world came into contact with us. Some of you may think, why be so sensitive? We who feel it know it, yet nobody wants to listen because it's not a big deal. That mistake could have been absolved if there was a person of color, a black person on that team to say, let's switch these shirts. We don't want any bad press. It benefits the workplace, doesn't it? Because you could have saved several hundreds of thousands, including a damaged shop in South Africa, destroyed in rage. Even if you have one employee, of a non-white background, your token, the one you take images of for your website, but they're the only non-white person in that company. You have to think about that for a second. And don't leave it up to that person to ask the question of when you will hire with diversity. Chances are, being the only non-white person in the workplace, and I've been there for 16 years, you're already battling with people touching your hair, asking you weird questions, do you live in huts in Africa? <laughs> Did you have a pet lion? No, I had a pet monkey difference. <laughs> Huge difference. Be that voice of reason to take it up with your colleagues and talk about it and take it to HR. Use your power, use your voice, be an ally, because it will benefit you in the long run. Even if you never continue working for that company, you will take those experiences with you to your next company and be able to make better decisions there. And social media, it's like the craze. All the kids are talking about it. I come from there at present time. Is your feed blindingly white? Do you see white, 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 yoga, white, dreadlocks, white, 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 white? Kenya. Is, is that what your feed looks like? Because social media affects us a lot. When we wake up, we're scrolling on the timeline. What we see affects us, the news, how we wake up and interact with the world out there. So if your feed is all white and you find yourself only reposting and resharing and only interacting with white activists, even when they're regurgitating information they've taken from black activists, how anti-racist are you? Do you find yourself following and then unfollowing black, Latin, trans activists? Because it's uncomfortable to have to deal with what they're writing, their truths, their realities. Because you have that privilege to say, I'm not gonna deal with this right now, I'm gonna take a step back and think of my mental health. I have to say there, even if you don't have white privilege, it's a privilege to learn about racism and oppression instead of live through it. We live in a social media world where we can interact as much or as little as we want with each other. I follow a lot of white people because it interests me, it helps me in my daily life to navigate. 
through certain barriers. But what benefit is there for you to follow a black person talking about racism, monkeys, or whatever it may be, my life in West Africa? It may seem on surface level, not very much, but underneath that, there is a heap of benefits to having that. And no, I was not kidding about owning a pet monkey in Gambia. It was very rude. So, let's not forget that racism even exists in the social media sphere. The amount of times people just send a DM and say the N-word and run away without having to be, having to take charge of their behavior because they can block me shortly after. <coughs> I want you to think there. Instead of just sharing posts by white women, using knowledge taken from black activists, why not repost and amplify directly from the source itself? Black people have been crying racism sucks <laughs> for the last five, 600 years, but whenever a white person says, F, racism, we give a standing ovation like it's, it's a revelation, but we've been screaming it for a very long time. So we have to be careful and look at what we're amplifying on our feeds because that feeds into our real life as well. Another strange group is influences. I am occasionally one. And this select group, they are a very select group. They follow every trend. They repost and reshare all these woke informations from black accounts, of course and when suitable for their timeline, because we know they're very busy, with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, they have, some of them have as many followers as there are black people in Sweden, and some of them have one million followers, which means they have power. They have the power to do something I like to call performative allyship. They share a couple of posts and say racism is really bad, and then they go back to their natural lives and they interact with PR companies and beauty companies and companies in general, going to events, receiving boxes of goodies. But they never, when they post the videos after posting exclusion is back, that the only people in their sphere are white. These PR events are all white. Even, and this is very funny, I found that very funny recently, a black company launched in Sweden, a Swedish PR company is dealing with it. So I emailed them and I said, here's 20 influencers that are of color because these products are formulated for darker skin tones. So of course you'd wanna advertise with them. And I checked their website. First thing that comes up, Mongfald. I said, okay. I click on employees on LinkedIn, all white. I don't know how Mongfal came in there. So I gave him a call, I was like, hi, Annika, my name is Levette Blackbird. Seeing that the products are coming in, it would be lovely if you could distribute them to amongst the black influencers. She goes, yeah, we've already thought about that. And I was like, okay, <laughs> well, I'll send you the list nonetheless. The very next week, I opened my Instagram and all the white influencers were opening makeup for black people. And it didn't make sense to me because these same influencers are my friends and they know what I work for, they know what I do with Black Vogue, but none of them could question why they were swatching black makeup ineffectively on their skin instead of asking the PR company, why haven't you sent this? to black influencers. And that's the realm of performative allyship. When I say share, amplify voices, I'm not saying be a hypocrite. I'm not saying share free Palestine and then go and buy apples from Israel. When you do something, you have to do it from within yourself. You have to take a stand. Because whilst you may be able to pick and choose when you can be an ally, we don't get to pick and choose when we are actually subjected to oppression. And the same goes for journalists. It goes for advertisers. Who are on, in those board meetings when you're coming up with new ideas to reach out to the gay and the LGBT community and the black people? 
do you actually even have black or gay people on that table making decisions? If not, you perhaps should hire first before you go take those discussions. Or you will make some expensive mistakes that are very hard to fix, because news travels fast. There we go. Media. And if anyone has been following me for the last couple of weeks, <laughs> months even, media is a tricky one. Are there any allies in media? Yes, there are some. I can name three thus far. Media is by far the biggest culprit in perpetuating racist structures. Most of you will witness it, read Metro, read Aftonblad at Expressa, Dagens Nyheter, without ever knowing or recognizing it, because you're consuming it. You've seen it perhaps happen to me a couple of weeks ago, when two public and loved personalities in Sweden used the N-word, the M-word, transphobia and exotification, all in one and same podcast, an hour. They managed to go through quite a lot. When I critiqued that, media decided to use flowery imagery, linguistic manipulation, to make me out, the person that critiqued, as the bad person and the actual aggressors, the victim. Anybody who doesn't know me or know my work, who reads those articles, will form an opinion about who I am that is far from reality. And as a black woman, you can't really do much because you don't have their private phone numbers. You can't call and rectify it. I think media has a lot of self-reflection to account for and proves exactly what happens when you go through life with a certain amount of privilege, never having to self-reflect, and then you suddenly find yourself in a place of power with a great deal of baggage of ignorance about other people's situations following you. Now, in order for me to actually speak about media, it will take me five hours, and we don't have that today. So I'll focus on you, how you can be a better ally, even with media affecting your mind and your daily opinions. If you're attempting to be an ally, you have to be critical of the sources where you get your information and the voices that media gives power to. You know, even in this political climate, wherever you turn on the television, it's Kalle and Oscar discussing migration. It's never Aisha, who's lived here for 40 years, talking about the challenges of migration. It's always a repetitive white voice, white voice, describing issues. Could also explain why we're so misinformed about immigration here in Sweden and what we actually spend. Public places, this is my last part. Public places. I always thought since I was a child that standing up for someone in public would be the most easy thing to do because there's people all around to back you up. But it has been proving over and over again that no matter how convinced we are of being non-racist people or anti-racist even, once you come face to face with verbal or physical attack on somebody because of their skin color, we get paralyzed. Some sort of bystander effect kicks in. And here is one of the places in everything where you're allyship could save someone's life. You can be an ally here without ever needing to put yourself in physical danger. I'm not talking about run in front of a gun or throw yourself down the train tracks, saving somebody. I'm saying in a world of media, you have a phone, you can record evidence, you can email it directly to the police, you can wait with the person that's being attacked until the police arrive. You could sit next to that person on the train. Just a signal to the aggressor that we don't stand for this. You don't speak for us. But since 2015, when I've been working with Black Vogue, so many people have contacted me, sometimes to vent and explain how they've been attacked or they've been um, verbally attacked or fired from a job for being a certain color. And the one thing that they express 
It's not anger. It's a sense of disappointment that people don't speak up, don't stick up for each other, or don't stick up for certain people. And who knows, if you do use your voice when someone's being attacked, or use your talent or your telephone, you don't know who you might be spurring on. You could be spurring on a whole series of allies to open their eyes and stand behind you and say, we also don't agree with what's going on. But because nobody dares go first, it just becomes a snowball effect of silence. Remember, if you see something, say something. And at the very least, record the evidence and give it to the police, who I do have great faith in. There are 100 more instances in our lives that we can choose to be allies. And I trust that when each and every one of you leave this room today, you will take that motto on that sheet over there, never stop learning. You will take your own initiative on your own time and find out how you can be an ally in your specific area of expertise workplace life at home because to stop learning for me is to stop breathing every day i have to go out there i have to learn about new people i have to look beyond our differences to see what we have in common there was a well-known public figure in sweden not very loved but well known who attacked me the other week because I had written something he didn't agree with. And I said, call me. Just pick up the phone and call me, let's talk. After an hour, he picked up the phone and called me. This is a white cis male. I'm a black female. On the surface, we have zero things in common. After five minutes of conversation, we both blurted out, I also have ADHD, I also have Asperger's. Suddenly, we were like, okay, that's why. Mm -hmm. Let's talk, let's just rewind the tape. And we found a, a ground of commonality where we understand why we react with emotion, why we have such visceral re reactions to justice or what we feel is injustice. But between us, the sex divide, the color divide, the status in society divide, we found we're both humans and we both apologize to each other and we left it at that. And that's what I want you all to leave here thinking about. Stop looking on the surface. Stop even asking, where are you from, really? Nina's hung, honestly, and Gambia. Look at what you have in common. Because if we could walk on this earth for one day with no skin color, no hair, no gender, how would we be? Okay, yeah, no gender still we would realize how much more we have in common than what's on the exterior. Now, as an ending point, I want you to remember that just because you wish to be an ally <laughs> doesn't mean every person from a marginalized group owes you a teachable moment or owes you their time or owes to explain things to you. There are resources available, again, that you can seek out. Books, online resources, just be source critical. So there's very little excuse to say, I didn't know. We live in the world, knowledge is everywhere. When someone says something offensive or hateful, maybe even a slur, or behaves in a way motivated by prejudice, as an ally, it is your responsibility to question that, to speak up and let them know you don't accept it and to address it. Get used to the reality that you all, including myself, have messed up quite a lot, and we probably will mess up a lot more in the future. What's important is not the mistakes you make, but how you take charge of them and what you do afterwards. Life allows for U-turns. Once you know better, you do better, because my grandmother once said, you don't know what you don't know until you know it. And that's how we should treat each other. Mistakes happen when someone says, ouch, that hurts, You've stepped on my toe. Don't proceed to tell them how you experience stepping on their toe not being hurtful. Just apologize, back away, do better. 
We may think that certain actions do not matter simply because they don't affect us. Again, I'm guilty of that. And I cannot make any one of you in here today or watching online change your actions because change is something we each decide to do ourselves and not something I can force anyone and you can't force anyone to do it. But you may get to pick when you can be an ally. We don't get to pick situations where we're free from structures. And lastly, I want you to remember that the word ally is thrown around so much it's almost losing its meaning. Being an ally is not a noun, it's a verb. It's not an identity you can put on and take off, like clothing. Being an ally is what you are. When marginalized groups you ally with recognize you as such. Thank you.